<laughs> Perfect. So we'll go ahead and get this kicked off. Um, we're super excited, not only for the fact that we have this awesome space, but this is going to be a great panel that we have been looking forward to for quite some time. Um, a little bit, of, actually before we jump into the agenda, we have the Wi-Fi network, Cuckoo, as well as the Wi-Fi password, which is inconveniently right on that line, but it's red bird pound flag. Um, and last housekeeping issue, restrooms are in the back left corner, so feel free to utilize those. Um, and in terms of the agenda, what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit of a welcome, introduce ourselves, uh, let you know a little bit about Branch as well as the sponsors of the event, mparticle, throw.co, um, and obviously Twitter and Vine for hosting us. Um, we'll give you a little bit of a background on one of the new features that we just recently released, and then we will dive straight into the meat of it, the, the actual panel. Uh, so a little bit about a little bit about ourselves. Tay is going to be moderating the panel today. She's the head of New York. Uh, myself, I work on the partner growth team over here for New York branch. And make sure to tag, if you guys are taking any pictures or tweeting at Twitter, which is pretty meta, um, <laughs> make sure to tag Mobile Growth. Uh, our head of events actually is going to be scanning each one of the pictures, so she'll be able to see, uh, I think she gets the choice on the best picture will get a uh, branch hoodie, and I have to tell you guys, they're super comfortable. So, um, yeah, make sure that you tag uh, hashtag Mobile Grow. Uh, Grow.co is one of our first sponsors. Uh, we are, they actually just hosted their MAU event, which is a massive, awesome event held over here in New York. Um, they do them in Vegas, or it's a, MA, it's New York as well as Vegas. Um, awesome guys, we have two of them over here. Uh, if you guys want to stop by and say hi. And yeah, I mean, massive shout out to Twitter and Vine for hosting us in this space. Our, uh, I mean, it's been a good problem to have, but our meetups have been getting so large that we're looking for some big spaces and uh, stuff, you know, spaces like this are really hard to come across in Manhattan. Um, so thank you guys so much for not only the space, but also the food, the beer, everything. And we'll get a couple of words from M Particle over here as well. Thank you. And I can attest that the branch hoodies are actually really comfortable. So definitely grab one. But um, thanks guys for coming. M Particle is so thrilled to be hosting this event as a supporter of women in tech. And as a woman myself, I am so thrilled to be participating in this as well and to be working at a company like Empirical that helps women grow. Um, and I'd love to be working, learning, and collaborating with all of you great women in our industry. So my name is Jillian Burnett. I lead customer success at Empirical. And today we're going to hear from a bunch of great women that are really leading the mobile growth industry. And so before we kick things off, I think it would be a great time, an important time, to talk about what it means to really architect a winning mobile data strategy. And that matters to everybody here because whether you are focused on retention, whether you're focused on user acquisition or engagement, the underpinning of all of those tactics is really data. We go to the next slide, we see that uh, there are a ton of vendors that we can all work with in the mobile space, right? And so for those of you who aren't familiar, this is our periodic table of app SDKs. We actually have those to take away on our merch table, so feel free to grab one. But as you can see, right, a large variety of vendors that you can work with in this space today. And what really uh, is the common thread among all of those vendors is data because in order to work with these vendors in order to get them to do what you want them to do they need your app data so if we go to the next slide if i am working on a mobile app and i want to use vendors across the app development lifecycle, i'll need to go to my engineering team every time that i want to use a specific vendor so that our engineering team will install a specific vendor's SDK, right? And I'll go to my engineering team and say, hi, can you please install this code so that this vendor can get my, uh, my data? And so that might be a vendor in the development lifecycle. It might be an analytics vendor. 
it might be an attribution vendor and can go all the way to uh, retention vendors like email and push and deep linking. And so all of a sudden, you know, as I'm going to my engineering team time and time again, there are all these SDKs in my app. I have data going every which way. My organization is confused in terms of what data is going where, and my engineering team is coming to me and saying, Jillian, we have 15 SDKs in our app. Our app is bloated. There's risk of crashing. I'm not installing one more SDK. And now I'm stuck as a marketer, right? Because I can't be flexible in terms of using new vendors as the, as the industry evolves. So that's a problem, right? Uh, if we go to the next slide, so this is really the problem that mParticle solves. Because as a data platform, we are a single source to bring data in one time and connect that data across the app ecosystem. And that's great for engineers because they don't have to work on maintaining and implementing 15 plus SDKs. And that's great for marketers because you can then take your data and easily send it out to different vendors across the uh, app ecosystem, whether it's Twitter for uh, custom audience uh, targeting, thanks Twitter for hosting, or whether it's a branch for deep linking, thanks branch for partnering with us. So uh, it allows marketers a whole lot of agility and flexibility in sending data out across the ecosystem. And you can skip to the very last slide. So today, mParticle is working with the very best apps to connect their data across the ecosystem. And we have a bunch of people here from mParticle today that would love to talk to you more about what we do. So definitely feel free to uh, reach out and talk to us, and we're excited to talk to you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jilly. Um, and also, one thing she didn't mention is that there are some awesome, they have some awesome swag over there as well. Actually, this little kickstand for your phone, which I'm pretty fond of. Um, I saw a couple of you guys grab it, but it's super cool. <laughs> so check it out, grab one on the way out. Um, so we'll speed through a little bit about Branch over here. How many people are familiar about Branch before we get started? Okay, it's a nice, nice amount. Um, we actually host these mobile growth meetups along with uh, the sponsors that we mentioned um, in over 51 different cities and we just crossed over the 17,000 uh, member mark so it's pretty cool if you guys are in different cities feel free to go check them out and branch in general so we're headquartered out in palo alto been in business a little bit over two years um, and have actually just recently crossed over i think it's 12,000 apps that are utilizing branch which is pretty cool when you actually think about it, a statistic I recently heard was about one third of the United States is clicking on a branch link on any given day, which is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, some of the partners that we work with are Airbnb, uh, Jet.com, right across the water in Hoboken, and uh, Pinterest, but uh, a bunch of big names out there uh, in the, are part of these 10,000. And how, how many people are familiar with deep linking? Okay, it's still a fairly, fairly good uh, number, but deep linking in general, if you actually just think a super simple way to think about it is a desktop link. If you were to go to, um, let's say, www.jet.com backslash Folgers, um, that's gonna be a deep link. That will take you to that specific Folgers copy, whereas if you were to click on www.jet.com, that would just take you to you know the home page. That's not a deep link. Um, and the problem here is that while that's intuitive, that user experience is great on desktop, it's fundamentally broken on mobile. And the rationale behind that is that there's a whole bunch of different standards. Uh, if we can go ahead and I think we can go to the next slide. Um, there's a whole bunch of different standards that are out there that just don't play nice together. Um, and the reason why this is such a big problem is when you actually go ahead and deep link and provide that same awesome user experience that you're seeing on desktop, um, and equate that to mobile, across the board we're seeing massive gains in terms of sign-ups, engagement, and retention. And yeah, so I mean, it's all those different four standards of uh, iOS, Android, Twitter, um, as well as Facebook, just being able to roll those into one and cover about 6,000 other edge cases. That's where Branch really provides you just one link that works, so you don't have to worry about all these different standards, both historically and into the future. 
High level branch will do basically three things for you. Um, so we covered that deep linking piece, uh, but there's also the short link, which will dive into a little bit more depth, but we actually own this app.link domain. So you can append your company's name in front of the app.link. Um, and then the attribution portion, where you actually get to see view, uh, your analytics on views, clicks, install, as well as conversions. And one of the coolest things is that this actually doesn't only work when you have the app installed, but also works when you do not have the app installed. So we'll still be able to preserve all that context, whether it's from an email, your mobile web, and still surface up that product within when you enter the application. So this is a little bit of a case study that we ran on app.links, um, and we wanted to see if branded links actually drove a higher conversion rate. What we did is we went ahead and we tested two different ads, one of which was just a generic URL that you can see on the top, um, and the bottom one was target.app.link. So two Facebook ads, same copy, same audience, um, just, just the two links that were different. And it turned out that we actually saw it two times the click-through rate on the branded links. So super powerful, but the one thing that we totally want to actually go out there and check is like, I mean, is this something that everybody else is experiencing too? So if we switch to the next slide, you can see, uh, we encourage everybody to go out there. These links are actually completely free to you. So you can go up to the dashboard. Um, and as soon as you sign up for the dashboard, just head down to the settings, grab your name, um, and then go out, like, go out there and you can start letting these links uh, live out in the wild and you can actually compare and test for yourself. So cool. Uh, with that said, what we'll do is we'll invite our panelists up to the stage and uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hey guys, how's everybody doing today? Hmm. Um, so my name is Taken. Too close to Kev. <laughs> um, and I'm the head of New York for Branch Metrics. Um, to kind of echo Julie, uh, Jillian's statement from earlier, um, very excited about today to be hosting our first actual woman in mobile growth um, meetup in New York. It was a huge success in Silicon Valley where we're based, so we want to replicate this out here. Um, something I'm personally excited about because um, in terms of the gender gap, I feel like it's addressed quite frequently from an engineering perspective in the uh, tech community, but very rarely from a sales, marketing, or product perspective. Um, and furthermore, even when we attend a lot of meetups like this and we host them, when we look around the audience, we typically see that it's about 10% of the audience that's actually female. So uh, really excited to kick this off, and especially having such a great panel with us here today, uh, Maureen from Rent the Runway, Tammy from Grubhub, and Fiona from Meetup. And continuing with the Meta theme, you know, having Meetup at Meetup is actually one of our best person goals. So we're really excited um, to have this panel here today. Um, so to kick things off, I uh, would love to hear a little bit about each of your companies, your specific roles, and what experiences led you to your roles today in, in Global Growth. So I get off. First of all, women in growth, I sort of thought it was a different type of growth, so I don't know if you guys got the memo. But, um, so I've been at Meetup for two and a half years. Uh, before that, I was at the New York Times for 14 years, which is a really long time. Um, so I probably have a bit of a non-traditional path. Um, uh, my roles at the time, just a little bit of background, I was always on the editorial side, um, played, I was editor of the homepage, uh, ran the web newsroom, and then my last job was, um, I was in charge of sort of building the first mobile hub in the newsroom um, and, and actually making sure that, that editors were focusing on our mobile products, which feels kind of quaint now, but at the time it was really important. Um, so always in journalistic roles, but with a product kind of focus. So um, I made the leap to meet up because I wanted to sort of officially try my hand at product and I wanted to be part of the tech world and uh, meet up was 
the right size company. We're about 150 people. We're 14 years old, so we are, um, you could argue, the grand grandmother of startups in the New York tech scene. Um, but uh, we have the spirit and soul of a startup, but some of the maturity of a of an older company. So. Um, so that's my background. I'm in charge of product, which includes design, product, and uh, co the community experience team. Um, and my big focus right now is we are working on relaunching Meetup. So there's going to be a brand new Meetup launching in September. Two of the guys who are responsible for that are right back there. So they came in late because they were working hard. Um, uh, so we are launching new apps, uh, a new, fully new design, we're rewriting our apps on iOS, we're rewriting it completely in Swift, so it's a, a relaunch, a replatform, a redesign, um, and we're doing it solely from the perspective of the apps first and taking those concepts to the web, so um, that's, that's been a really important part of my role is to try to make sure that Meetup is truly mobile-centric. Um, yeah, so that's what I do on a daily basis. Hi everyone, I'm Tammy Harrison. I work at Grubhub. I started there, and I guess I'm in New York, so I should say seamless. Um, everyone in New York knows seamless Grubhub. Uh, we market outside of New York. So I started there in October. I spent 11 years, so I guess we are loyal beings on the panel. Um, I was at American Express for 11 years. I worked in a bunch of marketing roles, and then I moved into mobile payments. So I like to say I played a product person on TV for a little while. Uh, and then I moved back to marketing and did mobile product marketing uh, at Amex. And I got the bug. I was in a small team uh, at Amex and really felt like mobile was obviously where the world's going. Got the opportunity to move over to Grubhub, and right now I'm doing product marketing. So I actually sit in the marketing organization, but we're the bridge between um, uh, marketing and product. So I spend half my time thinking like a product person and making sure that the best user experience for our customers and that all the needs that the marketing organization has, um, I can sort of lobby for us on behalf. And then I spend the other part of my time telling great stories about our product experience to our customers and, and really focusing on adoption of our mobile products. Uh, and if you don't know Seamless, I probably should have explained, or Grubhub, uh, we're the nation's largest uh, online food, online and mobile uh, food ordering app. Uh, so I think that's probably a good start. Hi everyone, I'm Maureen Sullivan. I work at Rent the Runway. I actually oversee our product creative and retail teams. Um, and I was babysitting our engineering team. I don't think they like that. We just hired an awesome CTO, so. Um, that was part of my charter. I joined the company in October. Uh, prior to that, I worked AOL, your mom's, or some people in your grandma's internet company, uh, for six years. Before that, I worked at Google, just down the street. My boss uh, became the CEO of AOL and took me with him. Um, so I've had a fun, kind of New York-based tech and media career so far. Um, and I, I really decided to move to Rent the Runway because I believe for all of us in the community audience, if you're not renting yet, you will be in the future. Renting is the new buying. We are not gonna own as much stuff as we all own today. And that um, everything is in the cloud, so why would your closet not be? Does it make sense? Um, so it's really an incredible opportunity, and I think a lot of people know Rent the Runway because I think it's a pretty novel concept. And it kind of makes sense on face value. Um, but I think what people you know, don't understand is we're much more like a utilization business and a customer service business than we are a street commerce company. So kind of the intersection of all those things and we happen to be the world's largest dry cleaner as well. Which is a business I didn't know much about 10 months ago. But if you want to know about dry cleaning, come chat with me. Um, and we have intense reverse logistics, obviously. 100% of what we send out comes back and then right back out again. So um, it's a really interesting, awesome time for the company, and I'm fortunate to oversee a really great product team, and I think you know, we are in the early innings of figuring out you know, how do you really um, make sure
sure that the mobile experience for us, you know, they can be infinite. And if you ask any woman or any human if they have any free time, when was the last time someone told you, I'm not really that busy, you know, everyone's too busy. And I think, you know, our challenge is just really being a service that makes your life, you know, 20 times easier. And, you know, we believe that the companies and products that do that are the ones that really stand tall above the rest. So, excited to be here. It's a good group. And we have way more than 10% women in the audience. If you haven't tried renting, come find me after. I'm shameless. You need to try it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, and it's funny, I've actually used the biggest dry cleaner in the country. Um, I've used that as a fun fact, as a conversation party. You know, at a, at a, as a conversation starter at like a cocktail party in the past. So, um, great. Well, before we shift over into your three, you know, apps, and I, I, I know you guys all have amazing apps. Um, wanted to ask you personally, what is your favorite app, and it can't be your own. I know this first. Um, so I happen to really love Instagram. Another one too. Um, I like it for two reasons. One, I like to pretend I can do good photography. You know, you sort of like take your moment and then share. Um, and I just love images and visualization, so I find it a really uh, enjoyable mental break when I need that. Um, and I also really love Songkick, which is an app for concerts. I think it's just from like a business perspective really smart. It's all about personalization. It's a way to find concerts based on your iTunes like music library. Um, and it allows you to know concerts near you and then purchase tickets. So it's like the concept, and I think it's a good user experience. Um, well, I'll give two, and I'm not saying this just because we're in the Twitter offices, but I actually do really like the Twitter app. I like the Instagram app too. This, is, this feels a little generic. I'm not coming up with anything super original, but um, the Twitter app is just. It's extremely fast and functional, and um, it, it does what you need to do. So that's that's one that I like. And then I'll give a shout out to my former employer. I do love the New York Times uh, iPhone app, uh, just for its simplicity and elegance. Um, so those are two my two my favorites. Yeah, Instagram. Sadly. Sorry, Twitter people, Twitter stresses me out like, way too much. Uh, so I don't think I carry well on Twitter. But uh, yeah, Instagram still feels somehow controllable. I've been slightly obsessed with Snapchat lately. I have little kids, and we don't actually snap anything. We just look at ourselves with a filter, and it takes hours of enjoyment. It's like the new YouTube in our house, like, can occupy everyone's time. So I just think. That has been fun and playful. Just have fun, having I mean, things that that feel light, you know, and can help. The other, it's not really an app, but there is a to do share to do functionality on iOS. You probably never used it, but I love it because I have a honey do list, and I feel like I can send my better half annoying things to do without having to send them an annoying email or text. So it's like an inbox of errands I need to do. So that's his least favorite app, and it's my most favorite app. So if you have a person that you're sharing responsibility with, I feel like try that. I feel like it's better than annoying pains throughout the day. But it keeps it all. It's very simple. It's like the low-key Evernote. That's how I would describe it. Perfect, and you're not competing with anybody else, I assume. Exactly. <laughs> Great. So uh, shifting a little bit um, more into you know the, the mobile space, and talking about you know, trends that we're seeing in the, in the industry today. Um, obviously, we're seeing that desktop users are all moving towards mobile. But even within mobile, we're seeing um, the transition from users from mobile web into native apps. Um, in fact, uh, we see pretty consistently across the board that users are spending about 20 minutes per day um, on the mobile web versus almost four hours per day in native apps. Um, furthermore, when we start looking at engagement and conversion rates, um, we see that native app users are converting at a 3x higher rate and also engaging at about an 18 times higher rate than uh, mobile web users. So, curious to see if you're seeing generally the same trends with your audience today. Yeah, we definitely are. That's the reason I referenced our big uh, redesign and relaunch, and it's the reason why we're doing that 
from the app perspective first is that we, like like many companies, seeing that the potential for engagement in the apps is uh, is huge. So we really tried to build the new meetup with that that kind of native experience at the heart. So notifications being a big a big piece of how we think about it, as opposed to kind of bolting that on afterwards. So. Absolutely, um, not that we don't care about the experience in the browser, it's still important, but uh, we're really shifting and trying to think of ourselves more as a, more of an app company than a, than a website. Uh, yeah, I would echo mobile matters a lot. Um, so over half of our orders come from our mobile apps, they're our best customers. Um, it's pretty natural for people to find us through web and to you know go to our mobile web experience or our desktop experience, but uh, it's a big focus of ours to convert people over to apps. We spend a lot of time thinking through uh, when is the right time in the sort of life cycle as to when to convert someone because getting someone to download an app it takes space on their phone. Not everybody's interested, so uh, for us it's a lot about trying to figure out the right time, the right message, and the right value proposition to make sure that we're. Uh, getting people to use our product, and then once they do, we definitely see conversion is stronger, engagement, and lifetime value is much higher. I think for us right now, what we're most focused on is really how can we provide a superior customer service element by having our app. So obviously our app customers are super engaged. I think in our business, we have people who spend a ton of time, like our average session is like 45 minutes on desktop, so the people want to obsess and look at all of our inventory, and we find the app, it's they're really engaged, but it's shorter, like it's more efficient. They're not going down the rabbit hole and kind of spending too long. Um, so, you know, I think for us, we're trying to find that balance of knowing that we think our app is a better experience and, and going to make it easier for her to rent, um, but not wanting to force that and really making sure that there's a reason that she can articulate of why placing the order in the app is better, right? And really having that be organic. And so a lot of the things that we're working on on our roadmap are, can our customer experience be 10x? More real time, more convenient, can she be chatting back and forth with the stylist? Can she change where she wants her order to go based on where she is in whatever city she's in? Um, you know, Can there be perks of customer service that go along with her engaging with us in the app? And you know, in our mind, that's kind of a de defensible mode. That's something I would explain when asked what's my favorite app. That's the reason why I always order an app versus you know, deciding to, to browse on desktop. So I think it's just finding that balance of when is it forcing and when is it you know, really the right thing for the customer. Definitely, and, and obviously you want to A-B test that stuff and see where you know the, the data is driving you. Um, curious. Um, when you think about growth, do you think of your app as a mechanism or a vehicle mainly to drive new user acquisition, mainly as a retention mechanism, or both? And, and Marie, kind of going back to you, especially curious because I know um, with like the unlimited service, I had a lot of friends on the wait list just waiting, waiting to get off of it and transitioning kind of those users that were you know one-off event users into more of the subscription business. Yeah, would no, love to hear about that. It's fascinating. That we have a subscription business that, that is relatively new, and it's really meant to be a subscription to fashion to power your work wardrobe, right? And so there's kind of this, like, you can pick three things at all times. You can keep them for, so kind of like always shopping, but with no price tag, right? So see a lot of browsing. What's been interesting is that we're finding, we thought those who were obsessed with like getting our unlimited subscription service in our app and having it be incredible, so we spent the whole first half of the year working on it. It's been greatly received, but you know the reality is a lot of women are doing is picking at work when they're on their desktop. So we're realizing, well, that's when they're doing it. That's when it's convenient. That's when they have 10 minutes of their day to figure out what the next three things in their shipment are going to be. So. Again, it's kind of letting the consumer drive where she wants to access it, and you know that for us meant the desktop has to be as good. We've kind of over focused on the mobile app experience, thinking that we're going to be she wanted to do it on the go. And she still wants to do that, but we're shocked to see the level of desktop engagement that we're getting from those subscribers. So, for us, 
it's equal. Like I, you know, some days I feel like I'm ninety percent retention focused, and other days I feel like I'm, you know, ninety percent new, new, new. You know, I think for all of us, it's kind of that constant balance. Um, but you know, we talk a lot about just like multiple shots at goal. Like there's no silver bullet to a lot of this stuff. So just making sure that you constantly have five or six tests and things lined up on both acquisition and retention, so that you're kind of constantly moving things forward. You know, I, I see, you know, in my short time as a company, and I saw this a lot at AOL, you kind of like over-believe your own hypothesis on certain things, you know? And like the more, obviously we all know this, like rapid iteration, and the more you put out there, you know, the smarter that you are. So I feel like for our mobile rep, you know, the, the nice thing about the app release schedule for us is like, I feel like it, it focuses us to be a little bit more organized around what we're going to put out, what we're going to test, and the amount of time it's going to take us to really make the right decision. So for us, it's totally a mix. And I think you know we have plenty of new customers that are only ever interacting with friends or only on the app. And you know I think it's you know, a huge, I think we're in the very first inning of getting the repeat orders from our loyal app users that you know, we could be. We don't do a lot of push. You know, and I think I would like the push to be way more customer service based and what she needs and what's going on in her life and how we can versus what we want to push to her. And that's, you know, not every company has that opportunity. So I feel like we have the opportunity to make the push relevant. And, you know, I think we're, we're not there yet, but that's, you know, in the future for us, hopefully. Uh, for us, our business is incredibly habitual. If you've ever used the product, You'll use it again most likely. So 90% of our orders come from repeat customers. Uh, so we spend a significant amount of our uh, media dollars on acquiring new customers because once you get them in the funnel, it's incredibly efficient and effective. Uh, but when driving mobile, it tends to be less cost effective for us to acquire someone on mobile. That's just what we've been seeing so far. So we spend a lot of our time acquiring people on, on desktop or you know, the browser experiences and then, uh, as we talked about before, converting people over. Um, and I would just say that we spend a lot of time thinking about active. So for us, it's diner, so active diner. So obviously not just acquiring them, but making sure that we're creating that habitual behavior. Uh, so for us, it is a, certainly a balance. And when it comes to our app, it tends to be much more focused on, um, on our, our retention strategies. For us, for us, it's both, um, and in our, just two quick examples, in our new apps, a big, big focus is making the concept of inviting your friends to meetups a core part of the experience. Right now, it's not. Uh, we've been working a lot over the last year to make that core, just to make it more normal, to, to bring friends to a meetup. It makes the meetup more fun, and obviously it helps us get more members. So that's going to be a core part of the new apps. And then on the other, on the retention side, <clears throat> making things like joining meetups and RSVPing to meetups really, really simple and one tap simple, especially on mobile, um, is really important because that gives us all the clues and feeds our recommendation engine, which helps us recommend the right meetups to you, it helps us send you smarter, more personalized notifications. So that's a key part of, of retention, both retaining members and retaining paid organizers who of course want to have the right members at their meetups. Great. And along those lines, and I know this is everyone's favorite question, um, would be curious to hear how you are today defining kind of your KPIs or your metrics around conversion and engagement. Um, especially more of the micro level, because I think it's really easy to say, hey, I want to get my daily average users up. But if it is something like you mentioned, Fiona, getting more people to share and, and driving up that share number, if you have any kind of unique metrics, would love to hear about those. I'll take that really quickly. Um, we've actually had a lot of debate over this in the last couple of months. So one metric that we're focusing on, which is new, which is uh, the number of members engaging other members. So. Um, it's, it's pretty logical that if you get a notification that is more personal, so it's about an organizer welcoming you or someone, you know, um, tagging you in a comment or, or uh, uh, messaging with you, 
that's that's better than kind of a general sort of system message from Meetup, the company. Um, logic tells you that, and also our data shows that those are much more valuable. So we're tr really trying to you know, think of engagement as much more of a member-to-member -member kind of thing as opposed to us just pushing out uh, uh, lots and lots of, of messages. We also, if you're a member of Meetup, I'm sorry, we send too many emails. So we're really trying to fix that and try to be smarter uh, and more personalized in how we view engagement. Uh, for us, probably the two unique metrics, so uh, new customers or new diners, or and for us, the, the main one is obviously order frequency. Um, I would say the probably two unique ones is just reorder rates. So mobile is so fantastic for simple reordering. So we look a lot at uh, people's, again, habitual behavior on the places that they reorder from and trying to expand um, the discovery there. And then the second would be we've just relaunched our uh, ratings and reviews functionality. So the engagement metric for us is customers after they've eaten, they've you know rated a restaurant and shared with the community. So that's a, a good example for us of engagement. So for us, um, order obviously, uh, and I think we're in a position where kind of organically it's kind of continues to surprise us. I think the, the big question for us is just should we do something, should there be an offer in place in an app, right, and kind of that turning point of do we want to kind of force it over that tipping point. Um, the other thing which is not a metric, and I think this drives my team crazy, but I see every piece of app feedback that comes in, in my email in real time. Um, and I call it like QA and a scale. Like it, you just instantly can see just based on the feedback alone. So, you know, for me, and I'm my own, you know, for most people that would drive me crazy, but I like it, right? I just, it's like I feel like I've got a pulse in real time of exactly what people are loving about our app or what's driving them crazy. And the wisdom of crowds, like they will call it. Like if there's something wrong in the release, they get it within a matter of hours, right? So, you know, I think sometimes we gloss over that. Like, people are telling us all the time what they think about our app and how they're using it and also just the commentary that they're giving us. So we try to kind of keep it simple and make sure that, you know, we're listening to that. And while looking at all the metrics and time spent, you know, on the time spent thing, when I got to the company, it was like, oh my gosh, look at our time spent, it's so amazing. I was like, that's a problem because it's taking her too much time and she's not going to do it very often if it takes her too much time. So, you know, I think there's also a way to look at each metric and kind of change the positive or the potential negative. So, you know, I actually think a scaled of a mobile dashboard and really having everyone on, on, on the team understand why each metric needs to be where it is and what you're aiming for um, is huge. Yeah, okay. uh, you made me think of another um, KPI is just NPS. So we recently just rolled out uh, functionality to capture NPS within our product experience. And then um, our product team spent lots of time sending the marketing team, why is your promo code not working? And so it's a good virtuous cycle and customer feedback loop to make sure that we're creating a, a good experience and using that as a benchmark. Great, and um, to your point about like NPS, curious to hear a little bit more about, in your world, um, the, the mobile tech stack that you're using on a daily basis, whether it be from a qualitative perspective or a quantitative perspective, um, what are you know the tools that really make a difference to you from a daily basis that you're obsessively looking at on it, you know, like the mobile dashboard, for example? So I don't think there's one tool at Meetup that anyone is totally in love with. We have a lot of homegrown tools that cause us to, um, you know, uh, curse and pull our hair out. So, but one thing that we are in the process of implementing is Looker, and everyone is super excited about it. So, um, you know, we're we're optimistic that that's going to solve all of our problems. Um, so I guess it just depends which part of the company you're in. So for us, we use Tableau as an easy way to take a look at a dashboard. So every day we get um, uh, information on year-over-year -year growth, daily growth by market, uh, by brand. So we use that as our sort of Bible to see how we're doing and a bit of a heat map on how things are going in each of those markets um, and by customer type. Uh, and then we, you know, obviously the product teams use, use things for crash 
analytics and you know all those kinds of tools, and then marketing depending on the uh, part of the marketing organization. Uh, we use lots of other metrics to make sure we are seeing how things go. We're all Tableau all the time. We have so many Tableau reports, we don't know what to do with them. Um, you know, I think one of the other things of just like a company different phases, and I worked in big and now a smaller company, you know, the dashboard's awesome, but it's way more awesome when someone takes the time to make sense of it for everyone and distribute it. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, shocked at how that sometimes is just like not a normal part of the culture, and I think sometimes when you're 15 people or 10 people, you don't need to do that, because everyone knows what the hell's going on, and every level number. But as you get bigger, that isn't the case. People get in their own little world view. So, you know, we have kind of had a like, death to just attach the report and like, drop the mic. You have to like, really, you know, own what you're telling everyone. Um, so yeah, it's been a, a year of, let's make sure we have the right metrics, but let's also make sure that we're actually talking about why something is going in this direction or that direction, and how we're going to fix it, and is this a quick fix or is this a pain in the ass thing that we're going to have to really think about if this needs to be a priority on the roadmap. So I'm kind of like anti-tool right now. Not, not in a broader branch IO type sense, but it, uh, you know, it kind of comes down to doing the work and making sense of what the tool is telling you. Yeah, just one thing, I, mean, I, was, I was being sarcastic about Looker solving all of our problems, but um, totally we spend uh, so much time also just trying to make sure that we trust the data. Of course, you know, you can look at an awesome dashboard, but if it's not actually telling you the truth, and, and, and also really struggle with, with cross-platform uh, data and getting the right story. So I'm, I'm sure we're not alone. It's a struggle everywhere, but um, constantly trying to improve it, but yet also not spend so much time on it that you're taking your eye off of actually launching things. I'll add one other thought you made me um, think of it. So right now the other big uh, area that we're trying to focus on is just a mobile dashboard. So we've got so many different uh, parts of the company focusing on driving mobile behavior, and there's lots of different places where the data sits. So that's a big focus of ours is how do you actually pull all of these different sources of information into one place that we can actually see all the tactics that we're doing and um, how we're actually growing. And we've given ourselves a nice lofty uh, goal, so we spend lots of time making sure we're hitting it. Great, and I think um, you both hit on something right there where you're saying, hey, you know, Yes, you can obsess about analytics, you know, day after day, but I think one of the reasons why we all work in tech is we love trying new things and, and breaking things and figuring out what moves the needle and what doesn't move the needle. Um, would love to hear from you in terms of a specific campaign or feature that you, you know, ran in the last six to 12 months, um, something that uh, worked really well and why it did, did, or on the flip side, something that you thought would work well and, and it didn't and why. I could start. Um, so about a, a little over a year ago, um, we made it much easier to join meetups. Sounds like a really simple thing, but again, it was part of like really thinking from a mobile perspective of simplicity and a one-tap approach being really important. Um, we also knew that getting new members into at least one meetup group in their first week makes a huge, huge difference, about difference in terms of whether we're able to retain them. And obviously getting them into five groups instead of one group is, is even better. So just by simply taking away a lot of the friction, um, a lot of the complexity, and also frankly making giving organizers less choice about all the different things, sort of blocks that they could put in the process of joining a meetup um, has had huge results. So we doubled uh, the amount of people in a meetup uh, in, in the first week and tripled the number of meetups they were in. So again, not rocket science, you make something easier, people do it, but uh, it was really, really important because again, those signals are what we use in order to recommend meetups to you in the future. Um, I mean, like, one of the things we did for our new, as I mentioned, our subscription service, which is called Unlimited, we did a big push to get that into our app in the first half of the year. And we just were able to do a lot more little featurey things in the app that we don't do our best on. So one thing that we did was meant to be kind of like a, 
onboarding, personalization, simple quiz that just asks you, what are you going to use this for, what it's about, it's very basic. And we thought it would just help the recommendation engine be stronger for that user. Turns out, flash to you know, four months later, as we look at churn for our subscription program, that's actually, that quiz is helping us figure out root cause of it, a churn. So what we're seeing is anyone that came into our subscription wanting like a black tie, a dress for a big event, they actually, they just like Rent the Runway, they thought, oh, this is a good deal, I want to enter the subscription, but they weren't looking for what the subscription is about, right? So it's really what, what I thought was going to be a feature just based on personalization in front of has actually been a huge strategic advantage for us to have that data and understand, and we would have never got that from the desktop adoption of the subscription program. So, you know, I think sometimes it's like the unexpected wins, you know, it wasn't like this big, this was some of our mobile PMs are written in the last minute, like let's just do this as a part of, part of onboarding, it's a few clicks, it'll be great. Uh, so that is huge. And then the other piece is, you know, a la Uber, when you return in our subscription business, it doesn't let you pick until you rate your experience. So anyone that rates something negative, we're still at the scale of our subscription business, but our customer service team can proactively reach out and really engage with that customer and understand what's at the inventory, what it's fit, you know, really, you know, kind of at it, when we're in this kind of early stage of learning to have that real-time insight. So I think it's it's things that are meant to, to really have an impact on the front end, but then ultimately, I feel like those have been the things that have guided our business decisions around this in a way that, you know, I, I never anticipated. Um, I'll give two examples. So one is from a marketing perspective, uh, we've uh, leveraged weather alerts quite often. So if it's raining outside or there's a snowstorm, it tends to be a really good time not to go out and eat and order in. Uh, so for us, it's all about uh, contextualizing the message, making it super relevant to the customer at the right time, and making sure that we're giving them recommendations that are relevant, and obviously confirming that you know we, we've had scenarios and snowstorms that a restaurant isn't open, so we need to make sure that we're not only you know enabling someone to order, but also making sure that the experience is good. Uh, and we plan to roll that out into our push uh, experience as well in the near term. Uh, on the second side of things, on the product side, um, we just, as I mentioned before, our, our ratings and review experience. So if you guys have ordered recently, over the last six months or so, we started um, asking customers through SMS, and then we have brought it into our product experience. And we've seen more reviews. I think we have like 8 million data points now. We've seen more in the last six months than we saw in the last 10 years of our business. So it has just been incredibly impactful. And you know, we've created it as just a few quick questions to ask the customer after their order and making sure that it's super recent. So we had done it in the past over email um, and we just found that the mobile experience was that much more impactful. And our ideal scenario is now to roll it into the product experience as well. Great, thank you. And, and totally agree with you. Um, I, I read a, a statistic the other day that um, on average, um, an Apple you lose about 70% of their daily active users within the first three days of somebody downloading their app. So creating a very seamless custom onboarding experience that isn't too cumbersome, that doesn't have too many steps is, is key. Shifting more towards retention now and some specific tactics. Um, I, we actually did a webinar with Ben Particle a few weeks ago and one of the key statistics that I took from there was that um, the average uh, user that has push notifications enabled in their app will actually interact with the app about 14 times per month versus if they don't have push enabled, they'll only interact with the app about four times per month. Um, so what, what do you think creates an effective push strategy? And um, if you could provide an example of whether it be your company or some other company that you think has done it well. Sure. Um, so for us, it's all about personalization. I mean, I mentioned earlier that we're really focusing on this metric of members engaging other members. So um, we've been working on a, a whole push uh, notification back end that allows us to be member centric uh, in the way that we send push notifications so that we um, you know, we look at when you last received a notification from us to know whether we should send you one now. And so it's a constant 
kind of uh, rejiggering of, of the member's score and whether or not they should receive the notification and what type of notification they should receive. We've been learning a lot along the way. It's really hard to get it right. Um, but, but push is a huge focus of what, uh, what we think about in terms of engagement. Gosh, and, uh, company is doing it right. I mean, we take, we take little snippets from, from lots of companies. I, I'm, I'm going to have to be at a loss of someone who has it all right. Um, certainly getting that, that, um, threshold between being aggressive, being surprising, being not afraid to, um, to push, haha, um, but yet not being really annoying is super, super difficult. So I'm going to have to punt on the who's doing it right, but uh, it's hard. You made a thing. My standard as a consumer is, is it curing FOMO for me? You know what I mean? Like, is, or what you put, what you're pushing me is something I need to know right now, right? And I feel like, you know, obviously news organizations have a leg up on us. And I think of like, just sort of trying to run through like, what push notifications do I get that I actually like that was helpful. Um, and I think you know the danger. Not, I know, but you know, um, don't have really formed thoughts on this. Like, I feel like this is an area where I, I sometimes think about it as just like how I feel about display ads or you know, ads in general, or my two-year-old like is like, no, like when the ad comes on YouTube, like get it away. Like, you know, just that training to not pay attention to it or be annoyed by it. So I, I do think it's a really delicate balance, but pain and bugging people work. I mean, it works in real, real life, like the squeaky wheel, you know? So, like, so I think this is a real challenge for brands to figure out. And we're not just all like screaming louder with more emojis sending stuff to people all the time. And I don't know, I don't have the right solution, but I, I think there probably needs to be better standards. And I, I think it'll get to the point where consumers will do a better job of saying, this is my standard, you know? And I, I don't think we're there yet. So for us, we're sort of on the beginning of our push journey. We just um, uh, launched a few months ago and we spent a lot of time thinking about push versus email. So for us and for everybody, really, you know, you have to really think about your push notification as a uh, very important and uh, meaningful message. Because the downside is you spend all this time getting your customer to download your app, and the minute you over send, they're going to delete your app. And so we are very cautious. So right now we're in the testing phase of. Um, how often we send to the right audience and then determining should we scale versus unleashing push notifications just like we can unleash email. In the email world is obviously an unsubscribe, which is super important and valuable, um, but right now we're viewing push notification as that much more important to be careful about. And the more that you make it about driving someone to an experience that makes sense in the product versus trying to just message someone um, because they have their phone in their hand. When I was at Amex, actually, this was a, a big topic we had. You know, the big idea was, okay, if someone has their phone all the time, this is a great way to message them. And uh, we try to think of it less as a pure marketing channel, but more as a product marketing experience and making sure that you're messaging them something that's meaningful in the product experience. And then on who does it right, I sort of mentioned habits before, but I'm a big fan of products that create good habits. So for me, soul cycle and guilt are two that I think do um, push right, because I always have the trigger of, great, it's time to book my bike, or great, there's like a sale going on. So um, we think about it in a very similar way of how we can create that, um, that habit and that trigger for um, bringing someone back to our product. Perfect, and, and I'll answer my own question here. Um, with an app that you mentioned earlier, uh, Songkick, a huge music goer as well, and so the dance in town or the song cake alerts where it's it's a utility for me and it creates a workflow for me because as soon as I get that, I know there's a finite amount of tickets, especially in the New York area, I'm in there and I, I'm marking my calendar, making sure I'm purchasing on time. Um, so unfortunately, we are running out of time right now. We want to make sure that uh, we get some Q and A from the audience, but did want to ask kind of one last question before we wrap things up um, and to loop things back to the beginning of the conversation. What advice do you have for women who are starting off their careers in tech today? Oh boy. Um, 
Well, I, I certainly had a non-traditional path to the tech world. Um, so my most of my you know early years in my career were in the media industry, which is a little different. Um, I guess my my two biggest pieces of advice, and this is well, I'll give one piece of advice, and this is not necessarily just for women, but the, the my guiding principle with my career has been always to take yourself out of your comfort zone, um, and certainly the last move from from 14 years in one industry to uh, a new industry was definitely uncomfortable in many ways, but um, with every new job I've taken, um, I've always felt a little in over my head and, and uncomfortable and I think that you really need to embrace that and um, and be okay with it and, and understand that that's a huge part of growing and, and thriving. Um, I guess for me it's actually probably just to forget. Like to me it's just you're at a company and you do what you love and you enjoy the people you work with, you're curious, you um, are engaged, you use products. So I think it's about actually taking the intimidation factor out and just um, you know being who you are in the environment that you're in. I was actually just in a meeting the other day and someone said to me, did you notice in this like senior leadership meeting there were X number of women? And I said, no, I didn't notice at all. Like I didn't even think about it. So I actually think it's way better to just um, not let that be a barrier and, and more just find the company and the experience and, and what you want to do. Um, I have a million ideas. I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot of female specific, but I think this, this a lot of the females I know and admire in the world just hustle. I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's a little bit overcomplicated. We just did a bunch of like leadership sessions around the runway and like, you know, work hard and be nice no matter who you are. Like if you think about the people that you've worked with in your life that you really were like, that person was awesome. I would take them to any company with me. I'd hire them. If someone called me to refer them, those people usually have two things in common. One, funny people, because funny people you just remember forever, because not that many people are funny. So if you get to work with someone who's really funny, they like stand out, right? It's fun to have fun at work. And two, people who work hard that you can rely on. And I, I, I sometimes feel like that people think that that stops when you get to a certain level in your career. Like, oh, when I get to that level, it's like, that is admirable, and those are the type of people that people want to work for and with. So that's a big you know, thing that kind of guides my thinking. And then the other thing, this came out of a little leadership seminar we were doing last week. Someone said this, and it's kind of stuck with me. Just be mindful of your intent versus the impact. Like everyone intends to do good stuff. They come to work every day. You all believe in the same mission, but you know, is your impact matching your intent? You know, or vice versa, right? So, and I feel like that's a big thing of just being aware. You know, like, like the best people to work with have great EQ, and if you don't have great EQ, you're working on getting better EQ, which I think is admirable as much as just having the EQ naturally. So, um, yeah, I think working hard is an underrated virtue. <laughs> Shocker. Um, so be funny, be forgetful, and take risks, right? <laughs> awesome, so we'll open it up to the audience now for Q&A, so go ahead and grab a mic right here. And if anybody in the audience has questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. Hi, um, great panel, thank you so much. So the question that I have is, are you guys looking at or even starting to implement Facebook Messenger bots? Because app to me is like the path. And I'm curious to see what you're doing or if you're thinking about it. We're certainly thinking about bots and talking about them. We're not actively at this moment doing anything, but uh, certainly just looking at Foursquare, which just released a bot, and um, I think your comment about apps being, you know, in the past is something that, you know, we're always sort of both afraid of and excited by what the future is going to look like, so looking at it, but not actively working on anything right now. 
Hi, yeah, for us, we talk a lot about um, will the app be here in the future? You know, the concept of contextual commerce and really being native to experiences. So we talked a lot about it. We don't have anything um, in market today, but it's definitely a conversation we have because I, I do believe um, capturing people in the experience that they're in and creating a, a native experience is super valuable as well as having your own. So uh, I think uh, in the future, I can imagine. So for us, it's really a question of customer service delivery, and there's you know potential huge value for us in delivering customer service on Facebook Messenger. I struggle with it though because I want our energy to be focused on delivering premium customer service, not learning that platform, right? So I think that you have to balance the the sexiness of distribution and scale with what's going to actually differentiate you on that platform, right? So that's a lot of what our internal debate is right now. Like, yes, this could blow this open, but when we do that, is it going to be an incredible experience? So I think, you know, for us, it's a customer service challenge, so that's the way that we think about it. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and I think most companies are grappling with it right now. We all love the platforms. We love the distribution that comes with the platforms, but there's just complexities to think through when you go after that. Um, certainly, in terms of what bots represent and the importance of conversational UIs, that's something that we are actively working on and thinking about having those conversational UIs really drive a lot more of the meetup, the, the online meetup experience. So, um, more to come on that in the future, but in terms of like looking at, at all of that stuff, absolutely look at it all the time. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you uh, for being awesome. And uh, I'm all for more female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's great to see you empower other women. And now I have a question that might make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, so they say I'm rich, and I <laughs> but I say it with a smile. Right? So <laughs> they say I have money, and I say okay, I want you to be the competitor of your current company. You have the money. What would you do better? Yeah. Be the competitor of friends the red ring. What would you do? You live by I'm gonna pick my own friends the red ring. This a lot. I mean, we, we think about if someone's in a room building competitors and runs around here right now, they're not building a desktop site, right? No, you, I give you the money and I told you to you build the competitor of front the runway. I would, sorry, we're that close. This is my favorite. You know, for us, um, we, the dream is that we, any person in the audience tonight, you know, female or male, because everyone has a closet, um, could pick exactly what they want to be wearing in the morning, and it would be on your doorstep, either by the time you get home tonight or before you get dressed for work in your day tomorrow. So for me, it would go all into logistics and delivering on that real time nature. And I think, you know, that's a lot of money. So I hope you have a big checkbook, because I have a lot of things I want to buy to get to that distribution scale. I want my runway in your office building, I want it on the street corner, I want that seamless ability for you to swap clothes whenever you want. And we, it takes us a few days right now, which is pretty good, but not good enough, I think, long term. So that's what I use your money for. Um, I guess big question. Our space is pretty competitive as is, so I don't know if it's a good use of your dollars. <laughs> um, I think, uh, uh, honestly, there's a lot of people going after what we're doing. I think we do it well. Um, I think others are trying, and I'd probably replicate what we do. It's, to me, it's about a good user experience. It's about scale. Um, and it's about uh, making sure that you're focused on what the customer and for us, what a restaurant wants. Sorry, not a good answer. Um, I'd probably build a much simpler product and I would build category specific experiences. So I can't say for sure whether I would have separate apps, but um, there are many, many different types of meetups. Uh, some look like this, more sort of classic panels and events. Some look like 
you know, 10 people walking with donkeys in the Hudson Valley. Um, some, you name it, there's all kinds of stuff on Meetup. Um, and so, you know, moms groups want different things than hiking groups want different things than tech meetups. Uh, and sometimes it's really hard for us to build one size fits all. I don't know if you can see me. Hi guys. Um, quick question. So they're adding ads to iOS, iOS 10. I'm not sure if this is something that you guys think is worth rerouting marketing money on. I just was curious on your feedback on it. Thank you. Are you talking about search ads? Yeah, search ads. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on search, so um, I think app discoverability, if that's what you're referring to, yes. is. Um, yeah, we talk about that. Um, there's so many apps in the app store, so I'm like leaning backwards. Talking, but, um, there are so many apps in the app store, so um, I do think it's valuable. Whenever we get app store placement, just naturally based on releases we're doing or you know relationships with the um, developers, it's always incremental business to us, so I think it's valuable. I can't say we've executed against it yet, but I do personally think it's worth testing. I think we will try it. I mean, I think for us, actually, getting a new app format just like presses creativity in a good way, no matter what it is. It's always like you want to try and you learn. Um, you know, obviously, for us, we had this lucky, like our, my New Year's treat, the app store featured us for like 15 days of the holidays. Like someone on Apple went on vacation and was supposed to like change it out. We like kept waiting for it to go away and it was there for an extra, you know, six days or seven days. So. Yeah, I and mean, obviously that, that distribution is, is amazing and, you know, anything that we could do to figure out whether it's paid or organic. And just also just, you know, constantly innovating. You know, our Apple contact came by today and just talking about video and how much they're interested in that. So, you know, there's just there's always something that's a priority for them, right? And so you figure out how does that become a priority that makes sense for us and if it does and what's the intersection and can that lead to really interesting distribution. Definitely interesting, um, to be completely honest, a fun fact, Meetup is 14 years old and actually has no marketing department to speak of. Um, maybe maybe that's obvious, but um, uh, we are, so so it would be a lie to say that, that someone is actively looking at that because they're not, um, but we are hiring a VP of marketing. So I'll take this opportunity to plug, if anyone knows any great candidates, let me know. My question is for um, Maureen and Fiona. In um, looking in the future, how do you see VR playing a part in your company? It is the future for us. I mean, I think um, obviously one of the barriers for our business is partly where we have retail stores, right? People want to see fit is a real thing, right? Like fit is a real thing. And, a bunch of male engineers think they can design an algorithm for fit that every woman in the world thinks her body is different than someone else's. So that doesn't work very well. Uh, so for us, it's going to be a massive game changer um, around just making sure that you're picking, when you have infinite choices, how are you picking the right thing that's going to fit? Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't zip, it doesn't zip. You know? So um, it is huge for our world. And you know, my obsession right now is just finding incredible scholars and people who have been obsessing about this for you know 30 years and it's finally like it's finally happening so yeah i think it's a game changer um i think it's just going to come down to what makes it easy you know i think sometimes these things are still so techy they just don't work in normal life so i think that consumer application of it is going to be what really allows it to have scale and practicality for our business. But yes, your infinite closet will be at your control to try on, whether you're feeling you know, five pounds heavier or skinnier that day, you know, it's gonna be huge for us. We talk a lot about VR, um, and certainly Meetup is very big in the tech community, so we, um, you know, people are gonna be using our platform, certainly, to be talking and learning about VR. I have to be honest and say that 
I'm kind of proud of the fact that I hope that Meetup is the antithesis of VR, in that uh, the thing that is special about Meetup is that people show up, they do things together, and they actually talk to one another, which is really important in this world, especially in this troubled time. And so, um, so while we love VR, we're excited by it, technology is at our, our core, we're also anti-VR and that we want people to talk to each other face to face. Hi, um, I'm not sure if this is a good question, but I was just thinking about like the first time I interacted with Rent the Runway, for example, was when I was senior in high school and I wanted to, you know, look at different prom dress because a lot of my classmates uh, were just like one-time customers, I guess, for Rent the Runway. They wanted to rent a prom dress. And sort of the same thing with Meetup. Like the first time I joined Meetup was because I was learning a new na language and I wanted to meet up with people, um, you know, so we could all practice the language together. I'm not sure about Grubhub, so I mean, I use the same ones all the time, which is like a Grubhub, but... I'm just wondering like, if you guys realize that there's like those one-time users and that like very specific kind of customer base that you have, and if there's certain things you do to like really tap into that sort of customer, because I feel like it must be like, you know, you have, I mean, for Rental Rowing, it's like, you know, the prom dress high schoolers and then the women with black tie events every weekend. Yes, we obsess over this. When someone says, oh, who's our girl? I'm like, our girl is an 18-year-old trying to figure out what to wear to prom, and she's my 67-year-old mom stressing about what she's going to wear to a family wedding this weekend. So, yeah, I think for us, you know, in some ways you can think of Rent the Runway as core as almost too branded to being a special occasion business. And people almost reserve us, like you have, to like a certain event in their life kind of like a guy in renting a tux, like it just it doesn't happen very often, right? And so, you know, our big challenge is almost our brand awareness and people knowing what Rent the Runway is, but kind of thinking, I don't, I don't really, I'm not going to anything fancy enough to use that. Like that doesn't make sense to me. So yeah, I think that's the huge opportunity for us. I think, you know, in some ways, and I have to remind myself this, this, this world is new to me, our product is not our app and our site. Our product is our clothes, right? And so the best way for me to tell you that Rent the Runway is going to be valuable to your life other than your prom, however many years ago that was, is to show you the clothes, right? And to show you the different events and different things in your life that we think it's smarter for you to rent than to buy. I mean, you know, the simple math is if you're gonna wear something two or three or four times a year, whether you make $20,000 or $100,000, it does not make sense to buy something and invest that you're only gonna wear a couple times a year. It's just a horrible investment. We're all really smart and work really hard for our money. So, you know, I think that idea of value and access are kind of at the core, but yet the big unlock for us is really explaining that we're not just for that, that very special occasion. Um, and doing that in a way that feels organic to you and not like we're spamming you all the time. But I think the inventory is ultimately what gets people to take a second look. And then they, they decide, oh, that would make sense for X thing that I'm going to. The average woman has 28 special events a year. We just don't use that language. Like, I've never been like, I have an event tonight. Like, I just, you know, I'm going to something, right? So I think for us, it's, it's kind of a positioning challenge to get you to think about. The use case I always use is I, had two baptisms for my daughters in like a, my kids are like close together, like an 18 month period. And I bought two very expensive dresses to wear to those baptisms. It was the stupidest thing I ever did. I like felt pressure to buy the nice dress because I knew I was gonna take pictures. I have them forever for the baptism. Like I didn't think about like the runway for those things, but that is a perfect use case where it's way smarter. It's high stakes for me but it, it was a bad purchase. It's a dress I'm never gonna wear again. So, you know, my mission and our mission is really figuring out how to, how to get you to take a second look. We talk a lot about one to two and two to three, you know, I'm gonna love people to rent 12 times a year, but I also need to make sure that we're, we're moving from prom to normal life as well.
not a dumb question at all. In fact, it's the, the sentiment behind it is the focus of our redesigns uh, and our, our new apps. So uh, this notion that, that Meetup gives you access to new worlds. So you know you, you want to learn a language or practice a language. There are many other things in life I'm sure that you want to do um, that you're not doing right now, and Meetup can help you do those things. So our big job is to is to you know if you come in for a language or if you come in to learn JavaScript or you name it. Uh, we want to be able to show you all the other things that you can be doing on Meetup. Um, so that's that's core to how, how we think about engagement. I'll actually add that um, it is relevant to us outside of New York. New York's sort of a, a special place when it comes to food delivery. It's part of the way we live. Um, in other parts of the country, it's um, not the same. Uh, so for us, we definitely spend a lot of time making sure that we have similar to you inventory for us as the restaurant network, making sure that we've got um, enough restaurants and that we're acquiring customers in the right place so they have a good experience and then um, building out a, a relevant, you know, sort of welcome stream to make sure we're engaging them and bringing them back as soon as we can. Perfect. And unfortunately, I think we are running over here, running out of time. But everyone, please, you know, stick around. There's plenty of food and, and drinks here. Um, the panelists can stick around for a few minutes as well in case you have any questions. And um, thank you all so much for having us today. I think we all learned a ton, and it's been fun. Um, if you guys enjoy these kind of expert type panels, we throw these every other month. Additionally, we just launched a mobile growth community online um, where we have. Uh, Global uh, mobile experts speaking um, about every week or every other week. We had um, everybody from Twitter to Pinterest to SoundCloud, so feel free to join those as well. Um, thank you guys so much.